We want to begin by welcoming all of us to this place on this Good Friday. This area is known as Bedote, and it is sacred place for Dakota peoples. It is the place where the Creator began the work of creation, of blessing, of abundance, of weaving all the creatures and plants and elements of the world into being. It is the site to which Dakota women journeyed to give birth so that they might bless their children with the power and beauty of this place. We who gather on this Good Friday do so seeking to walk in solidarity and love with the one who created and who is creating still. So as we begin, I invite us to take a few deep breaths to honor this place and the sacredness of it. Take a few deep breaths that we might begin ourselves fully present here. Jesus, keep me near the cross. There's a precious fountain free to all a healing stream flows from Calvary's mountain. It is especially important that we call upon our breath and all that is sacred on this day. Too often, Good Friday in Christian churches has been an opportunity to perpetrate crucifixion. Too many of our Jewish kindred have been murdered in the name of Jesus on this day. Too many have been abused in a distortion of the ritual of Good Friday. Too often, Good Friday's remembrance of Jesus' execution has resulted in the torture of others. But today we gather with a radically different understanding of what this day means to us. In each of our communities, we've been taking a journey through Lent that moves from ashes to the cross. In various ways, we have been invited to examine brokenness and what makes for sacred resistance. Lent also asks the question of how we are able to let go of the toxicity of vengeance and instead choose vulnerability. It asks us to wrestle with individual, communal, and societal brokenness and how we are both perpetrators and targets of oppression, and how, amidst it all, we resist the violence, the vengeance, the oppression, through healing and revolutionary joy. But before we can fully claim that joy, before we can know the resurrection, we must face into the reality of Good Friday. Pain, suffering, abuse, these are all the all too present realities of our day. Crucifixion happens and it continues to happen. But today we name and claim the ways in which Jesus' crucifixion is a moment of God's radical solidarity with all who are oppressed, wounded, and experience violence. We name and claim God's willingness to experience in God's body what it was meant to be executed by the powerful of the world, executed in the same way that countless people and the planet 
suffer at the hands of power today. Good Friday does not valorize crucifixion, and it does not celebrate violence. Good Friday condemns all that would break or injure God's precious creation. But Good Friday also names the reality that violence and oppression do happen in all of our lives. And God is here, radically with us, and keeping vigil. What wondrous love is this, O oh my soul, O oh my soul? What wondrous love is this, O oh my soul? What wondrous love is this that calls the Lord of this to bear the dreadful curse for my soul, for my soul? To bear the dreadful curse for my soul. Our Good Friday Walk for Justice has been planned collaboratively by Healing Minnesota Stories, the Interfaith Coalition on Immigration, the Racial Justice Program of the Minnesota Council of Churches, the Center for Sustainable Justice, and Lindale United Church of Christ. Over the course of our time together, we will walk from the historic Fort Snelling to the Dakota Memorial and the confluence of the Minnesota and Mississippi rivers, and then to the Whipple Building, where Immigration and Customs Enforcement, ICE, is housed. At each stop, we will commemorate a station of the cross and name how the crucifixion is alive in this place, woven together with Jesus' crucifixion. And we will name how we are called to be grievers, mourners, rememberers, and resistors of all crucifixion. So let us begin our service. We invite you to join with us in our responsive opening prayer. We gather this day in solidarity with Jesus, those throughout history and those today whose cries for freedom have been silenced by fear, betrayal, and crucifixion. We gather this day as witnesses to fear, to betrayal, to crucifixion. We gather this day to acknowledge our participation in fear, in betrayal, in crucifixion. We gather this day to resist fear, betrayal, and crucifixion. May God be with us. May God be always with us. Pilate brought Jesus outside and said to the people, Look at your king. At this they shouted, Away with him! Crucify him! Then Pilate handed Jesus over to be crucified. When we think of Good Friday, we are reminded of stories of betrayal, 
injustice, and death. It is important to remind ourselves also of the stories of betrayal, injustice, and death that surround us every single day. Here in 1865, nearly two years after the U.S.-Dakota War, two Dakota chiefs, Shock Pay and Medicine Bottle, having sought shelter and refuge in Canada, were drugged and kidnapped and brought back to this place, Bedote. They were put on trial and convicted, condemned. There were no defense witnesses called. There was no testimony given. And on November 11th, 1865, on this land, immediately behind me, they were executed, hanged by the neck until dead. After that, their bodies were placed in barrels and disappeared. Their relatives to this day still look for their bodies. We stand looking at the historic Fort Snelling, and if we turn, we can see the Fort Snelling Chapel that was built in the 1930s. It is appropriate that we stand between these two buildings because it was both Christian theology and governmental law woven with military might that kept Dredd and Harriet Scott and dozens more enslaved within these walls. It was to here and from here that the theology of Christian supremacy and empire's might condemned so many. It was here that the actions of the U.S. military, U.S. courts, U.S. slaveholders, and U.S. Christians baptized slavery and indigenous genocide. Crucifixion's legacy lives on in this place. Jesus was led away and carrying the cross by himself. He went out to what is called the place of the skull, Golgotha. We're here now in this valley, this Bedote, this sacred place at the confluence of the Minnesota and Mississippi rivers. This is a place for Dakota people that has long held a sacred story, a story that has called them since time immemorial. It is to this place that Dakota women in full term of their pregnancy would sometimes walk two or three days to reach this valley to give birth to their children in this place so that the birth of their child and the story of their people weave together seamlessly. For it is in this valley that the Dakota creation story is held, where the first Dakota footprints were placed into the soil. And sadly, it is into this valley where following the War of 1862, 1,700 Dakota women, children, and elders were forcibly marched across the breadth of this state, 150 miles in six days, 
and were kept in a concentration camp here in this valley. This place that holds their story. This place that remembers their songs. They were held here behind a stockade fence. A stockade fence. A piece of equipment which is literally designed and engineered to contain livestock before they're slaughtered. It is in this place, the place of Dakota Genesis, where the United States government attempted their genocide. Disease took its toll with quick efficiency. It is reported that when the diseases were running particularly high in that winter of 1862, those soldiers who had come down from the fort every morning to collect and bury the dead. It is recorded that when the diseases were running particularly high, those soldiers were busy digging graves from sunup till sundown, day after day after day. On average, they lost between three and four people every day. Three to four people every single day. As the winter of, as December of 1862 gave way to January of 1863, those soldiers who came down every morning to collect and bury the dead perhaps noticed that they weren't getting as many bodies. Maybe they falsely attributed this to good news. Maybe the disease had run its course and fewer people were dying. But the reality is, is what happened to their relatives 90 miles west of here. The story of what happened to them reached the ears of those surviving here. See, following the war, 38 Dakota warriors were hanged. Their bodies were placed in a mass grave the day after Christmas, December 26th. On December 27th, health care workers, doctors, college and university professors from around the area descended upon Mankato. They unearthed the mass grave and they stole each and every one of the bodies. That story reached the ears of those here. And rather than trusting the soldiers who came down every morning, not knowing what would happen, not knowing if the bones of their relatives would end up as a paperweight on a doctor's desk. Instead, they buried their relatives here, in this place, in secret, in silence, carrying the cross themselves to the place of Golgotha. When I was sinking down, sinking down, sinking down, when I was sinking down, sinking down, when I was sinking down, beneath God's righteous frown, Christ laid aside his crown for my soul, for my soul. Christ laid aside his crown for my soul. Having been beaten, tortured, and deprived of food and water, Jesus cannot carry the 165 pound weight of the cross. He falls under the physical and metaphysical weight of his impending execution. We are here near the confluence of the Minnesota and Mississippi rivers. We're at the base of historic Fort Snelling. Foundational to an indigenous worldview is the living truth that land, that place, holds story keeps it alive, 
gives it breadth. And this place, this valley, this bedote, holds countless stories. We've discussed the concentration camp and the harsh and terrible conditions that were meted out to the Dakota elders, women, and children. In the spring of 1863, it became illegal to be Dakota within the borders of Minnesota. And so the survivors of that concentration camp needed to be removed from this state. The official language of that order called for the extermination and or forever banishment of all Dakota people from the borders of Minnesota. Think about that language, extermination and or forever banishment. This is the language of genocide. This is the language of systemized oppression. As soon as the ice broke on the river and boats could navigate once again, two cattle barges docked here, not a hundred yards behind me on the Mississippi River. And the survivors of the Dakota concentration camp were loaded onto those barges, cattle barges, and were sent down river, exiled out of the state. As Jesus stands again and takes up his cross, he is surrounded by mocking and cruelty. He gazes at those who are hurling hatred at him and finds his mother. She can do nothing but hold him for a moment. Powerless to stop what is happening to her beloved, she bears witness and offers love. We are standing in the shadow of the fort, in the shadow of the empire, but we are also standing within close proximity of the original four oaks. They were the trees that were encircled and protected from the Highway 55 project and eventually cut down. But when they were cut down, the number of rings showed that they were planted by someone amidst the concentration camp. We're also standing in the shadow of Dred and Harriet Scott's living quarters. Although enslaved, they fought for decades for their and for others' freedom. It was their case that went all the way to the United States Supreme Court, and it was the ruling against them that united the abolitionist movement and that led to the Civil War and the abolition of slavery. We are often powerless to stop what is happening to our beloveds. But in the shadow of the Empire's forts, we too are invited to bear witness and to offer love. A man named Simon of Cyrene was coming in from the fields and he was brought to carry the cross of Jesus who was too weak. Over my shoulder is a hill. In English, it is known as Pilot Knob Hill. In Dakota, it is known as Ohiahui, the hill much visited. It is a place of honor, remembrance, and burial for Dakota people. As recently as 2006, this hill was slated to be desecrated by a real estate developer. They were going to put luxury condominiums up there to benefit the wealthy and the elite. Quite literally building 
their palaces on top of the bones of indigenous people. This hill was saved, yes, through some grassroots indigenous activism collectively coming together, but it wasn't that alone. This hill was ultimately saved because some well-intentioned white women from the suburbs added their voices to the collective outcry to save this hill. Quite literally coming together to carry the burden that one cannot carry alone. They stripped off his clothes and began to mock him, saying, All hell, king of the Jews. Inside these walls resides Immigration and Customs Enforcement. It is here that dozens of immigrants come every single day. Some have been in detention, a euphemism for the imprisonment that they endure, for several months. Far too many come from being held in solitary confinement, even though they may have mental illnesses. Such confinement is a torturous experience. Many have been moved from county jail to county jail with no access to counsel or family. They are moved here for their immigration hearings. They are brought into the courtroom in orange jumpsuits, shackled at the wrists, at their ankles, and at their waist. 75% of immigrant detainees cannot afford a lawyer. But if you cannot afford a lawyer, you are 12 times more likely to lose your immigration case. This is a vicious cycle that mocks those whose lives hang in the balance.
Jesus came to the place of the skull, Golgotha. There they crucified him and two others with him. It is out of these gates that the condemned are sent. Many will return to countries where death is swift. Some will be exiled to countries where they know no one, alone and afraid. All are captives of the same systems of slavery, concentration camps, exile, and genocide that have been at work for centuries here. The body of Christ that was crucified that day on Golgotha is crucified every day. In this place called Bedote, Christ's body is crucified through concentration camps and executions, through family separation policies known as boarding schools. As ice vans deport human beings away from their families and children are separated from parents in cages, Christ's body is crucified anew. And what are we to do? We are invited to bear witness, to grieve, to mourn, to remember. And now we are invited to share in the feast together. We are invited to share in communion. We now come to the time in our service of a shared feast, a gathering around a crowded table. This eating together, this sharing of food and kinship is one of the most powerful ways we have of living in solidarity with one another. It is one of the most powerful ways we have of strengthening our individual and collective bodies of work for the resisting of crucifixion in our world. In these times of COVID-19, as we are separated from one another by physical distance, we must find new ways to nurture and sustain ourselves for the work of resisting crucifixion and practicing resurrection. We invite each of you in your own homes to gather some bread and some wine or juice so that we may all consecrate our own elements and partake together. We remember that on the night before Jesus was killed by those who feared him, on the night before she died of exposure at the concentration camp. On the night before his trans body was murdered. On the night before they were left to die from COVID-19 in a nursing home devoid of healthcare workers. On the night before her body was destroyed by a pipeline. On the night before he was deported by ICE. On the night before he was arrested and crucified, he took bread and blessed it and broke it. He said, this is my body broken, open, shared with you. And each time you eat this ordinary bread, remember the extraordinary transformative power of our lives when they are broken open for justice and love. Then he took the cup saying, this is the cup of liberation. Each time you drink of this cup, you participate in the promise of new life and are now in communion with God. This table is open to all. You do not need to be a member of any church or any religious community to partake. For we believe that Christ is the host, Christ sets the table, and Christ welcomes all. Stay with me, remain here with me, watch and pray, watch and pray. Stay
Stay with me, remain here with me. Watch and pray. Watch and pray. Today, we stand with the women who watch Christ's agony from afar. Enable us to follow the example of their resilient and persistent love. That being steadfast in the face of horror and injustice, we may also know and practice solidarity and resurrection. Amen. shall find rest beyond the river.